In this podcast, we're going to talk about how to describe fractures. I'd like to acknowledge that some of the pictures have been reproduced from Brinker's review of trauma. What is a fracture? Well, it's a break in the continuity of a bone. It isn't always as simple as that. Sometimes there can be a break in the medulla of a bone without a break in the cortex. There may be a break in one cortex. There may be a break across both cortices. And there may be a break in the cortices with displacement as well. Typically, when there's a fracture, there's pain, there's tenderness to touch, there's deformity, and there's loss of function. Why do we have a nomenclature? Well, essentially, it's to aid communication so that you can convey to a colleague on the telephone an accurate picture of what kind of injury the patient has sustained. And traditionally, this has always been done verbally. Now, in this day and age of mobile phones, it may seem very straightforward to take a picture of the x-ray or the patient and then to send this to your colleague. However, I'd advise against doing this because this is a breach of patient confidentiality and you may find yourself in trouble with your hospital administration and with the GMC. What I'd advise is that you use the medical illustration department to take photos or use a departmental camera following the departmental protocols accurately. There are many ways that we can describe a fracture. We can describe whether it's open or closed. They can describe whereabouts the fracture is. We can describe the uh, geometry of the fracture. We can describe whether it's simple, i.e. in two bits or more than two pieces. And we can describe displacement and, ally and uh, angulations. If we look at this uh, picture on the left, we can see that there's a break in the skin overlying the fracture. This is termed an open fracture. The picture on the right demonstrates no cuts in the skin, no bleeding, and this uh, is a closed fracture. It's obviously deformed and there's a break in the bone. Now, it isn't always obvious that a fracture is open. There may be a break in the skin somewhere else, but then there's some communication like a tunnel underneath the skin going to the fracture site. And this might be possible to spot on an x-ray because of air in the subcutaneous tissues in between the break in the skin and the fracture. We can also describe a fracture in terms of whereabouts in the bone it is. If it's in the long, thin part of a long bone, then this is called diaphyseal. There's a cone-shaped part of the bone that joins up to the diaphysis, and this is called the metaphysis, and this ends at the physeal scar. The physis is where your bone grows when you're uh, a child, and in an adult, this is marked by a physeal scar, where the physis is fused. On the most proximal and the most distal end of the bone, beyond the physis and the physeal scar, you'll find the epiphysis. And if there's a fracture through this, it's an intra-articular fracture. It's possible to determine the mechanism of injury from the direction of the fracture line. And this is an important piece of information to convey. A transverse fracture may occur from a direct blow or it may occur because of axial loading. Oblique fractures can occur because of bending, and a spiral fracture can occur because of torsion or twisting of the bone. We can describe a fracture as being comminuted if there are more than two pieces. A pathological fracture is when a physiological force has been put across abnormal bone and this has resulted in a fracture. Normally when we describe fractures, they're not pathological because they're supraphysiological forces which uh, have led to a break in a normal bone. Uh, and this can be uh, through a fall from a height or through a direct impact such as a road traffic accident. A pathological fracture occurs because there's something wrong with the bone. And this may be uh, something simple like osteoporosis or it may be uh, a secondary tumour or a primary tumour 
or even just a simple cyst within the bone. An incomplete fracture occurs when only one cortex is involved. A segmental fracture is uh, describing a fracture where the bone has been broken in two separate places and there's a loose piece of the diaphysis in the middle. A fracture with bone loss describes a segmental type fracture where that piece of bone has been lost out of the body. A butterfly fracture describes a triangular piece of bone which can occur with any uh, 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 of the other types of fractures such as a transverse, an oblique or a spiral fracture. Um, it looks like a butterfly in profile and this is where it gets its name from. A stress fracture may not uh, result in a complete break in the bone but there may be a reaction of the cortex indicating that there has been damage to the bone. An avulsion fracture occurs when a muscle pulls on the tendon which is attached to the bone and the join between the tendon and the bone is stronger than the piece of bone and the rest of the bone and so that piece of bone is taken off with the tendon. And an impacted fracture occurs when the bone is compressed on the in on itself rather than being pulled apart. In children's bones we can see different types of fracture which are separate from adult fractures. A torus fracture is caused by axial compression. So uh, a fall on an outstretched hand may cause this type of injury. The word torus is derived from a description of a type of column um, used in architecture. A green stick fracture occurs as a result of bending. There is a very thick periosteum on either side of the bone and if there's a break in the bone, then the intact periosteum can act like a piece of elastic and uh, cause bending uh, deformity of the bone. The Salter-Harris fracture describes a fracture which is adjacent to the physis, either going through the physis or um, going through part of the physis or crushing the physis. Now, describing translations can be a little bit complicated. In the US, they use a different nomenclature to us in the UK. In the US, they tend to describe where the proximal part is in relation to the distal part, whereas in the UK, we describe a, a, a fracture displacement considering the distal part and where that has gone relative to the proximal part. So in the picture on the left, you can see that the distal part of the tibia has moved anteriorly compared to the proximal tibia and this is therefore anterior translation and similarly in the second picture where the distal tibia is now lying posterior to the proximal tibia this is posterior translation. In the third picture you can see lateral translation and the fourth shows medial. We can describe angulation in terms of varus and valgus. Varus means that the distal fragment is pointing towards the midline and valgus means that the distal fragment is pointing away from the midline. You can also describe this in terms of where the apex is. So a varus is a lateral apex and a valgus is a medial apex. Rotation can be internally or externally rotated and the length of the bones may be changed. If they're shortening there's overlapping of the bone and with distraction, the bones have actually been pulled physically apart. Now, you may come across eponyms such as college fractures and Smith's fractures. I think these are best avoided, as they mean different things to different people. After all, Collis described his college fracture in an age before x-rays, so really that's just a clinical deformity. But it's useful to know what they mean, so a college fracture is a fracture of distal radius which involves dorsal translation and dorsal angulation. A Smith's fracture is the opposite, so it involves volar angulation and volar translation. A Barton's fracture is an intra-articular fracture of the wrist. A Galeazzi's fracture is a fracture of distal radius with a distal radial ulnar joint injury. A Montegio fracture is a fracture of the proximal ulna
and this can be associated with a distal a proximal radial ulnar joint injury or with a radial injury. And the Jefferson's fracture is an actual compression injury on the C1, which results in the bone fragmenting and the pieces being distributed in a radial direction. Now, if you're going to describe a fracture in a fracture meeting, it's useful to have a system so that you can either uh, flannel for time or you can make sure that you don't miss anything out. So I would suggest that you start off by saying this is a play radiograph of and then say the name of the patient which should be on the x-ray itself and say when uh, and on what date the x-ray was taken. You can say which views you have so that could be an AP or in this uh, case a PA view of the wrist and a lateral. And then you can describe whether it's an adequate or inadequate x-ray, i.e. is it showing the joint proximal and the joint distal uh, to the bone that you're interested in. So in this case, this is an inadequate x-ray. And then it's useful to start your description by saying what the most obvious abnormality is. Because if you save this until the end, the person who you're speaking to may not realise that you spotted the glaring obvious abnormality and may think that you're a fool. So it's best to mention this first. You can then talk about other features that you have noticed on the x-ray uh, after you've talked about the most obvious abnormality. If you'd like further information, please visit our website www.orthocycle.org on the courses that we run. And for further information for FY1s on basic orthopaedics, please visit www.orthofy1.uk.